online service, probably some of you participate in that. Unfortunately, I won't have time to talk about that. I also have a corpus research with online asexual discourse data. So in linguistics, the corpus is just a large body of text. Um, and then today I'll look at how um, this can inform our understanding of the development of um, the asexual community. So there are a number of existing accounts of the history of asexual communities. Um, so David Jay has a, a class paper that he had put on Aven. Um, it's not there anymore, but it's been archived on the Wayback Machine. Um, he had a podcast about history of asexuality. Uh, there are two things by me. And then um, Nat Tittman uh, had a talk on the history of asexuality <laughs> at the last um, asexuality conference at uh, World Pride 2012. And then the Aiden Wiki has some uh, good articles. So, um, in my view, probably the best one is um, Nat Tittman's, um, who's also the most recent. Um, ignore the, the numbers, it, it really was more recent than the other ones. Okay, so the data that I have are, so most of the forums uh, on Aven viewable to um, non-members. Uh, and so I've been, because some of the parts are less about asexuality, I've, um, for the graphs here, I just have sort of the, the core part of it, which is generally the things listed under welcome, asexuality, visibility, uh, and education, and identities. Um, and then the other stuff, so the community discussion, and then small forms are not here. Uh, I also have data for Haven from the Human Amoeba through 2005, um, and then two live journal communities, um, a positive and about 70 um, non tumblr blogs. The big limitation is I don't have data from Tumblr because it's just so much more difficult to... Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so uh, rough timeline. So about 1997, about 2001-ish, you have a few static content pieces here and there. Um, you have evidence in them that people were talking to each other. Um, they talk about emailing each other and corresponding to people on email. Um, then for Haven the Human Amoeba, uh, it was created in, I believe, October 2000. It was in Yahoo clubs, which was mostly later merged into Yahoo groups. Um, so it, it was a listserv and then also had a chat room initially. Um, so by mid to like 2001, it reached a critical mass. And then you really had this explosion in the amount of discussion in um, August of that year. So it was most active from August 2001 until the end of December 2002. And activity declined afterwards. Okay, so another community is um, elder asexuality. So for a number of years, right, Avon was definitely the biggest one, and then the, the second biggest one, in a very distant second, was the um, large journal community, um, Asexuality. So that was founded in 2002 by uh, Nat Pittman, um, in response to another uh, community um, called Asexuals that Nat thought was um, too sex negative. And so LJ Asexuality was created about a, a month before the Avon forums with the goal of being a um, an explicitly sex positive asexual. Uh, it was most active 2005 to 2007, presently not very active, but you still have a number of people who follow it. Okay, so AVEN was created in 2001 as a static content site. Um, in, in 2002, uh, David Jay started the process of acquiring the domain asexuality.org. He finally uh, got it and then set up forums in uh, late May of 2002. And then by the end of 2002, Avon had clearly become dominant in asexual discourse in terms of sheer volume. <laughs> and then media articles, a lot of people feel impressionistically the sense that the new scientist article was sort of the, a, a big watershed moment. So one of my questions is, you know, can we get quantitative evidence that it really was all that big? Um, if, if it was, we should be able to find some kind of quantitative data to support that. And so that's something I wanted to look at. Uh, also, you have lots of articles since then, and, and the question that I wondered is, you know, which ones really had the biggest impact? And so that's something we want to look at. Okay, so here we have graphs. Um, so the black one is the, this is the number of posts on Haven for Human Amoeba, and then um, the red line is the smoothing of 12, so if you're not familiar with that, it's basically, so the six months before and the uh, five months after, and just average that, uh, it makes it easier to see general trends in the data. So 
But what we see is it's most active there from right about here to here. Um, and then we have periods of a little, a lot, a little, a lot, um, through about here, and then not too much after that. So this was especially important because it was one of the first places that you really had a lot of asexual discourse going on. Although later it should declined. So this is the data for um, the life journal of asexuality. And so this is words per month. So with an email thing, it's easier to do posts per month. Um, but because here you have, you have your, your main entries, then you have comments, and main entries tend to be a lot longer than comments. Um, and so this is the activity there, the number of words per month. So what we see is initially it wasn't all that active and then grew. Um, and then about 2005, so yeah, roughly here to here is where it's the most active. And then you, you see the general decline and, and there's not too much um, recently. Presumably this is just because live journal in general can become um, less popular. Although I, it's been difficult to find um, concrete data on the libraries. Now, this is the um, distribution of number of words per month in four asexual communities from 2001 to 2003. So, uh, at the Haven for the Human Amoeba, the library community asexuals is the one that asexuality was made in response to, um, then elder asexuality, and then Haven. And so what we see is, pretty quickly, Avon comes to dominate in terms of um, quantity. Probably by, I would say, the end of 2002, it has become dominant. And if you look farther out, the trend is even stronger. So I, I ended the graph in mid-2003, because if you go much farther, you can't even see the rest of it very well, because it's just a tiny little thing at the bottom. Okay. And then this is number of words per month on the eight. So note that this last graph ended about here. Um, and it goes up after that. Okay, so we see a general increase. And then in late 2004, uh, it goes up a lot. So that, that is um, October of 2004. So it is consistent with the idea that um, it was the New Scientist article that really made the, the difference. Um, and I, that, that is indeed the case. If you look at, um, in terms of, if you look at it by day when you have the jump, it, it fits with the New Scientist article. Okay. And then um, it steadily goes up. That big dip there, uh, that was a data loss of about 20 days um, at the beginning of 2010. And then, that big jump there in 2010 <coughs> is largely the um, trans yada thread. Um, so trans whatever to even uh, accounts for about half of that uh, jump. <laughs> yeah, that one took about an hour to figure out what on earth was going there on there because you know most of these big jumps they correspond to media article, and that one well, wasn't anything. And it's just a trans yada thread. <laughs> okay, so yeah, the general impression is that the October 2004 article in New Scientist was a watershed in the age of asexuality. So it does quantitative evidence confirm this? That looks like the answer is yes. Um, so, and then as a more general question, can quantitative evidence show which media articles had the biggest impact? Um, and I think the answer is yes at least for short-term impacts. Like long-term impacts are much harder because you have lots of things that are involved, but short-term impacts are, are um, better. And so two um, things we can look at, so I'll just be showing you the first one, is instead of words per month, what I looked at is number of first posters per day. So in my data, I find everybody who posted at least once, because if they didn't post, they're not in my data. Um, and then, uh, because I have the date and the thread and the um, author ID, um, the username, and then I can find out, okay, what day did it make the first post in my data? And then how many people made their first post on any given day? Okay, that make sense? 
So, so it, it's sort of like new users, except it's new posters. And so if you look at it by day, um, you may notice a few gigantic spikes on this. Um, so the first one corresponds very well with the new scientist article. Um, so all of these, they correspond within, it's either the day of or the day after um, the media article came out. And then this here is the 2020 article. Uh, there are two because of um, the first showing and then a rerun. Um, and then that's Montel Williams, the Montel Williams show. Uh, apparently the rerun actually got more um, visibility than the first one. And then, I hadn't really expected this one to be big, but um, the, uh, there was a BBC thing in uh, January of um, 2012 that got a lot of attention. 